I wasn't in love with Saltburn. I know everyone around me was, but I wasn't. I loved the idea. Barry Keoghan, Jacob Lordy, of course. It was impossible not to love them. And that was part of the problem. Everyone told me I'd love it, that it was this shocking, profound social satire. It exhausted me. People just wouldn't leave me alone, especially the TikTokers. Christ, the TikTokers. It was embarrassing, really, how everyone fawned over this film. I think, honestly, that's why it took me so long to even watch it. I wanted to protect myself because I knew I'd be honest about it, and other people probably wouldn't take too kindly to that. The internet loved it. They loved it. They loved it. But was I in love with it? I want to start with the positives. Saltburn is a bit of a miracle because it's an independent film that has absolutely no IP it's based on and still modern audiences flocked to it. Over 1 million people have logged the film on Letterboxd. Compared to other independent films of the last year, even some of the more popular ones like Talk To Me, it has at least 400,000 more watches than the second most popular. That's insane, that's impressive and encouraging. It also has had a weird staying power in the culture, specifically Gen Z and all of them doing, you know, doing this dance on TikTok. No matter how I feel about the film, no matter how anyone feels about the film, it has to be said that this is incredible. It's amazing to see, I want to see more of it. It feels like cinema is healing. We're finally not only watching movies with Iron Man made by a committee that feel like they kind of lost their vision along the way. We're getting people excited about movies, the craft that look beautiful, take risks, have performances that leave you with something to think about. Movies that have a voice and true creative vision. But with that being said, I don't get why this happened with Saltburn. The performances are great. The visuals, especially the cinematography, are gorgeous. Shout out to Lena Sangren because he quite literally can do no wrong behind a camera. Choices are being made. I love that but they don't feel cohesive at the end of the day. A large part of the conversation surrounding Saltburn is the taboo moments of the film. Moments that are supposed to shock and disgust you. Moments that you're supposed to walk away from thinking, oh my god, I can't believe they showed me that. Licking, uh secretions out of a bathtub, period blood running down someone's face, fucking a grave. Me just telling you those things might take you back for a second. On paper, yeah, that's some fucked up shit. In execution though, they all feel very tame. They feel kind of goofy, actually. It all is in this effect of trying to prove to the audience how much of a quirky weirdo Oliver is. Even though Barry Keoghan is giving it his all with his performance and truly is incredible to watch, it all feels so try-hard, and it makes you feel underwhelmed as a viewer, at least for me. It's the double-edged sword of casting someone like Barry Keoghan in the lead role. He's almost too good, too mysterious for what the film has to offer. It makes the mischievous, scheming moments more engaging to watch because Barry is just so fucking good at being a goddamn off-kilter psycho, but the film around him doesn't do enough to support the sheer weight of his titanic performance and thus collapses under it. I hate to use the word, especially for a filmmaker who I really enjoy and respect in Emerald Fennell. I love Promising Young Woman, but pretentious is about the only word I'd use to describe Saltburn. Like so many of us looking through our neighbor's virtual window, Oliver doesn't just want to be Felix's friend. He isn't in love with Felix, as he alludes to at the top of the film. He wants to be Felix, consume Felix, which would be a hell of an insightful revelation if I hadn't seen it done twice as better in 1999. Yeah, 
you know where I'm going with this. That's not to say I'm opposed to seeing a different director's take on past works, but I feel like Fennell should aspire to have her sophomore effort be more than a talented Mr. Ripley redux. Sometimes putting your own twist on a story creates new classics. Each version of A Star Is Born has a director's unique vision and take on the story to varying degrees of success. The point is, the lack of substance underneath the surface only further adds to the frustration when the film tries to make sense of Oliver's sociopathy. Yes, desire is an innately human instinct and can push people into doing unwieldy things. Maybe that's the point. But Fennell doesn't seem to be interested in engaging with that instinct much more than what I just said. It's the embodiment of every high quality glamour shot with a filter edited in Photoshop for your phone that you've ever had the misfortune of scrolling past on the morning feed with a caption that reads, live, laugh, love. If you wanna make this your big gothic social satire, a eat the rich story with some bite, don't hold back and maybe dig a bit deeper. If you want to be a vibes only film, which I've seen a lot of people praising this movie for being, but the visuals just don't have the heft required or the meaning in order to make a vibes only film work. Once you set up all of these interesting and seemingly nuanced characters, the promise of power games, social and class dynamics, I can only feel so invested and in turn feel really disappointed when by the end of the film, they have only been used for their most surface level elements. It's as if Fennell gets so caught up in the reveal of it all, this psychological thriller that, much like Felix, Elsbeth, and the rest of this family, she discards the toys she was playing with out of boredom and something more interesting, to her at least, comes along. The problem then takes root in who you're supposed to side with in the film. If you're constructing an Eat the Rich story, why, by the end of the story, would you make Oliver the bad guy? We don't have to like Oliver either. Stories wherein every character sucks are amazing. It's what's so great about It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's why people like Joker. But even within that sort of narrative, constructing Oliver to be the specific bad guy is really, really weird when both sides are supposed to have things you distinctly disagree with. It's kind of the grossest thing about this film. Oliver's visceral hatred for coming from the middle class feels cruel not to the characters in the film, but to the audience, the middle class, watching the movie. Yeah, most of us wish we could all have a cushion, a carefree life of luxury, but people who are middle class make up the majority of people and aren't ashamed of it. That's just a fucking weird slight against the largest demographic in the world and kind of tips Fennell's hand on how she views them. I'm sure it's not malicious or anything, but it's absurdly tone deaf. The film goes from musing on the ideas of morally bankrupt elitists, their lifestyle and their entitlement. Oliver is just as entitled as the other siblings in Saltburn since he's playing the game, it's a survival of the fittest story or whatever to nothing more than a common criminal who orchestrated this nefarious plot to take what he wanted. Yeah, he was playing the family like Felix playing with his toys, but everything that precedes the reveal is nullified. It all means nothing. And that, I think, is the chord that struck hardest with Gen Z, who have already adopted this film so hard. Jesus Christ. Christ, this shit really makes me sound like the fucking old man yells at clouds. Ugh. This might sound like a bit of a generalization. It probably is, but Gen Z, by and large, loves nihilism. It is rooted in their minds as a pinnacle of existence. And this movie really seems to push that idea hard. But nihilism only gets you so far, and that idea puts the film at odds with itself. Life can't be fully meaningless if the entire struggle of your main character is to steal this house and be naked in it and, by proxy, rich in it. I guess Oliver fills the holes in his life with meaning by invading the lives of these people and taking it over. This makes the comment made by Farley, Felix's adopted brother, at the beginning of the film so ironic, though. It's completely valid 
like to debate the rhetoric of an argument. It's not what you argue, but how. Now, yeah, this is supposed to be foreshadowing to poke holes through Oliver's logic of, if I'm disposable, what does it matter who I become? So long as it satisfies Felix's savior complex. He's keeping up appearances, which is the most important thing at Saltburn. That savior complex seems to run through the family as Felix's mother, played by Rosamund Pike. Again, I can't stop talking about how good the actors are in this, and Rosamund Pike might be the best out of the bunch. It's actually insane. She does the exact same thing with her friends. Until, of course, she gets tired of them. There's the general neglect of the uglier reality that exists around everyone. What happens if I bring them up? What a glorious day! A lack of honesty with the world at large, and that idea is so intensely interesting. How do we hide ourselves from the hideous atrocities that not only happen in the world, but that may also be brought about by us, especially the elite? All of that would carry so much weight if, again, Oliver didn't turn into a fucking supervillain at the end. It makes the superficiality become the reality because his motivations feel so paper thin. I guess the movie sort of poses the question of is the family much better than someone like Oliver? Their methods, while different on the outside, are somewhat similar, and it's the obsession with the fantasy and superficiality that is their undoing. But there also comes a point where the family cracks, and that's when Oliver swoops in and rids them, or kills them. He will literally murder an entire family to keep up the facade. You can say what you want about the family in the film for being condescending white elitists who fawn over charity cases, but for as much as Fennell wants to present it as such, the two actions, Oliver's and the family's, are not equal. I cannot get over how the ending of this movie just completely upsets everything that precedes it. It mixes the messages, it makes the motivations way less interesting, and it makes already unlikable characters even more unlikable. And then we get to one of the biggest issues with the film, which is that I feel an immense amount of sympathy for this family, even though they suck. And I really shouldn't be, because they suck. Saltburn makes a lot more sense when you realize that director Emerald Fennell comes from the British upper class. Obviously, I can't speak for her, but given the nature and confusing messaging of the film, it's clear she likely has very specific class politics that align with her poshness, at least subconsciously. I, I mean, I, I would hope she's not actually trying to say these things deliberately. To the elites, Oliver is the boogeyman, and I don't know about you, but that's really off-putting. Her characters being thin and shallow, prioritizing style and shock value over substance, make for many problems throughout the film. But the most damning is that it robs Oliver of a compelling plan and motivation. It doesn't quite add up, and so we're left with a horribly confused message. This core misunderstanding of where the satire of the film should be placed has inspired a bunch of tone-deaf TikTokers to replicate Oliver's final dance in the mansion because they thought it validated their lifestyle choices and superficial desires. What? <sighs> I'm going to take a little divergent pathway here to discuss an instance of a story like this that kind of has its cake and eats it too. For a few minutes, let's talk about the early 2000s teen drama show, The O.C. There isn't a character like Oliver in the show who is so desperate to steal this life. In fact, the main character, Ryan Atwood, is like Oliver in the sense that he comes from a lower-ish class, but he is accepted into this life with moderate ease. But this is because the show has one of the best fictional characters of the noughties, Sandy Cohen. A guy who grew up in Brooklyn, in a similar economic status to Ryan. He's married into this world of hoity-toity rich people, not because he wanted to steal the life for himself, but because he found true love. The show tells us that this kind of environment can actually lead to your demise, or worse, your death. Spoilers for a show that's nearly 20 years old in a video about Saltburn that you weren't expecting me to talk about, but you know, you've been warned here. The main love interest for Ryan is Marissa Cooper, who through the course of the show becomes basically just a mountain of problems for our other characters to solve. She gets hooked on drugs, befriends the most evil people, and makes very bad decisions. And all of this leads to her death in the season three finale. The goal of the OC is not to tell you that living this lifestyle is amazing and all it's cut out to be. 
The goal is to tell you that living this way is poisonous to who you are. It's a message that you can't misinterpret. The way the other characters stay true to themselves, the way they save themselves at the end of the show, is by leaving the OC. Saltburn just kind of haphazardly stumbles into territory it's intellectually ill-equipped to grapple with, resulting in some really puzzling moments. It's like Fennell knew she wanted to make a provocative movie about big ideas, but didn't really give any thought to what those big ideas were. It just reeks of student filmitis, a facade with nothing behind it. The fact it's being touted as this big deal film of the year is, again, just very embarrassing. We've reached the aesthetics over story film Twitter singularity. I will never understand why this movie clicked with so many people. I mean, I can vaguely get it, I guess, on a purely aesthetic level, but it could have just been the timing of when it came out, or again, truly people may see something that I just don't see in this. To me, it feels like the epitome of aesthetics over story. The true realization of a video online where they also play subway surfers and Minecraft just to keep your attention. The biting satire of this film feels more like teething than anything else. And I know you'll probably find this hard to believe, but I'm still excited to see what Emerald Fennell does next. I think she has potential if she's given the right material or she decides to write about more appropriate material that she's probably better equipped to tackle. But sometimes all you want to do once you get to Saltburn is leave. There was a murder on the dance floor, all right and Emerald Fennell killed the groove.